often, um, you know, when you see all the sin in the world and everything that's happening, and it's just like God's grace is just so amazing. There's nothing that his grace, that blood will not cover. No matter what you've done or even in the past or so even in the future, we, we all screw up. But his grace is amazing. Amen? Amen.
message, we're going to, you know what, when this is the time, again, around Easter, we focus on Jesus, right, and the name of Jesus. And what I was always thinking about, every time that we pray and we say in Jesus' name, we are actually invoking all the authority that comes in that name. And that was the name that, that Jesus raised people from the dead in his name. Demons were cast out, people were healed, lies were saved at the name of Jesus. And we look around uh, about how many times we use Jesus as, you know, people hear it as a, a swear word, even using God, like we're not to take the name of the Lord. But this is the time to focus on just how beautiful that name is and how powerful and how wonderful it is.
name means the Lord saves. Yeshua, the Lord saves. Pastor Choi, he's on uh, he's on his vacation and he's stuck in Tokyo and uh, having some issues with getting his flights home. So we need to pray for him and his family. If you have a need in your heart, why don't you just lift it up to the Lord in prayer today as we go to Him together? Lord, again I thank you for your name, representing your authority, representing your person. Thank you, Lord. It's the name by which we all were saved. We thank you this morning, Lord, that we can call on your name. We called on your name when we were away from God, and you answered and you saved us. We thank you today, Lord, for your resurrection. Lord, that you proved you were the Son of God, not only by dying to save us from our sin, but by raising, by being raised to new life so that we can live a new life in you. We thank you, Lord, that you're still alive today. We sent you in our hearts. We feel you in our in our meetings. Lord, I feel you right here this morning, Lord, the resurrected Christ. And so, Lord, because you're here, we can reach out to you. And I pray, Lord, for any particular needs represented by the people who are here this morning, Lord, as we reach out by faith, as we reach out by faith and call on the name of the resurrected Savior, as we reach out and touch you and our spirit will touch yours, May there be healing and deliverance and provision and transformation. And Lord, whatever else is needed today, we pray, oh God, especially this morning, Lord, we pray for Tim and we thank you for his life and his ministry in this church. We pray for complete healing in Jesus' name. That we, oh God, with no infection, no complications, Lord. We also pray, Lord, for Pastor Choi and Agnes and, and Timo and Titus, oh God, Lord, Lord, if they have their trip interrupted like this, Lord, I just pray that they would get their flights home soon, Lord, and that it would not ruin their, their time they had away to relax and enjoy each other as a family. Bring them back to us safely and quickly, Lord. May they feel and sense our prayers right now, God, wherever they are. Lord, this morning, as we look into your word once again, I pray that uh, the joy, the reality of resurrection of Christ would come alive in our hearts. Teach us from your word, Lord. I pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning I got a picture for you. Easter egg hunt. Proof your child can really find things when they really want to. <laughs> Right? You do that, kids. Mom, where's that? Dad, where's that? Where's this? Where's that? But Easter egg hunt, they find those eggs wherever you put them, right? Yeah. You can hide them the best you can. They will come up with them. So there is proof. Uh, praise the Lord. Thank God for this wonderful season. I still wonder how chicken, how uh, rabbits lay eggs, though. I've never been able to figure that out over the years, right? We got. See the Easter Bunny coming with eggs in his uh, basket, right? How, how does that happen, right? How does, Steals it from the chicken. Steals it from the chicken. Oh, so the Easter Bunny is a thief. That's our Easter lesson for today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, let me just get uh, refocused here. We're going to get into the message. Uh, there we go. Who, my best topic this morning is who will roll away the stone? Mark chapter 16. Here's the story. It says, Saturday evening when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of, G of James, and Salome went out to purchase burial spices so they could anoint the bu Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. 
When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. So you know, Jesus was crucified on the Friday. The following day, or actually from sundown Friday till sundown Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath. And so the Jews, they didn't work, they didn't go anywhere, they didn't do anything, but that on the Saturday evening after the Sabbath had ended, these uh, three ladies, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, there's a lot of people named Mary in those days, you notice? And uh, also Salome, who many people believe was Jesus' aunt, actually. We won't get into all, all of that now. But um, went and purchased burial spices so they could anoint the body. Because in, in those days, when they laid uh, bodies in the tomb, they didn't have the embalming thing like they did, like, like we do today. So what would happen is after the person was buried, uh, friends, relatives would come and, and put uh, special spices and that over, over their body so it wouldn't, you know, give a bad odor and it would also be preserved a little longer. It was a way of sort of honoring the person who died by anointing their body with certain uh, spices and, and, and things like that. So this is what they wanted to do for Jesus. So I want to notice some things about what happened when the ladies decided to go to the tomb that very first Easter morning. One, well, let's notice their dedication. Their dedication, one, they had a dedication to the law of God. They didn't go up there on the Sabbath. Now they were dedicated Jewish believers in Jesus is what they were. They had, we hadn't come into the new covenant time that you and I live in today. And, and they were very devout to the law of God. Even though this was something very important they wanted to do, they kept the law of God. You know what that tells me? You don't have to break God's law to, do, to serve Jesus. Amen. I've heard people who go around saying that. Well, I know this is wrong, but I'm doing it for the Lord, so it really doesn't matter. Now, there can be times if the law prohibits you from worshiping Jesus or, or doing what the, what the Lord says, you know, yes, there are times, but those are rare exceptions. If we are going to show our dedication to God, we can carry out the will of God without breaking uh, the laws of God and the, and the things God has commanded us to do. They're, they had a dedication. Even though they wanted to serve Jesus, they were going to do it the right way. They weren't going to break God's law. Heard, heard one lady one time, actually I didn't hear it, but a, a pastor friend of mine said there was a lady in his congregation came to him and said this. She said, I feel called to the ministry, but my husband doesn't, so I, I guess it must be God's will for me to divorce him so I can follow God's call in my life. I'm sorry, no. That wasn't you, was it? <laughs> it was the other way around. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I've heard, you know, it sounds silly, but I've heard crazier things of people thinking it's okay to break God's law as long as I'm doing it in, in the name of the Lord. That is, you know, that is so far away from gospel truth. They also showed their dedication to Jesus. Notice they purchased the burial spices. They gave of their resources to Jesus. Not only were they, uh, did they love him, did they serve him, but they were willing to give to him. This was expensive. These spices were not cheap. They were things that would cost a great deal of money, yet they were willing to give their resources to honor Jesus. And again, those of, I, I appreciate your faithful giving in this church, and those of you who donated to uh, the pastor's conference, God bless you, giving of your resources to honor Jesus. But also it says they started out really early. They got up at sunrise. How many people like getting up at sunrise? A few crazy people like that. <laughs> a lot of us don't, right? Yeah, Damon's down there going, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, and uh, I mean, I some, of our, our, some of our uh, youth were on spring break this week. Any of you guys up at sunrise on spring break? I kind of <laughs> doubt it, yeah. I mean, uh, huh? 
I have to wake up before sunrise to get to work. Oh dear, that's, that's awful. <laughs> but they got up really early. It's amazing how a lot of, now of course we don't have that problem, we don't start till 11.30, but it's amazing how many Christians find it hard to get up for church on Sunday morning. Right? I mean, that's... You know what, I'm, I'm in three weeks from today, I'm going to be at a church in the northern Philippines, Epicenter Church, one of my favorite churches in the world, and they have seven services on Sunday. And I'm preaching at four of them. The first one is 7 a.m. And it's full. And then they have one at 9 that's full, and one at 11 that's full, and another one at 5.30 in the evening that's full. And uh, three others going on at the same time as, as the others. So they rise early. Here's another thing I want you to really get. They still wanted to serve Jesus even though he had not done what they expected. They were expecting him to be the earthly king. He's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to come back, overthrow the Romans, restore the kingdom of David to this earth. He's going to make uh, throw off the oppression that God's people, the Israelites, have been undergoing. And he didn't. As far as they were concerned at this point, he had failed in his mission. He had been crucified and buried. They weren't going to the tomb to say, let's go and see if he's alive. No, they were going to anoint a dead body. Jesus had not done what they expected. He had not done what they wanted him to do, and yet they were still devoted to him. How many times when we're really expecting something from God, we're praying for it, we're really anxious for it, and then for whatever reason, God doesn't do what we want the way we want. Some people get really discouraged in their faith. That's the point. Oh, I asked God to do this. God didn't answer my prayer, so I'm just not going to serve him anymore. The true test of your faith is not, a lot of people think of, if you have great faith, God will always answer your prayers. No, the real test of your faith is what you do when God doesn't give you what you want. When God disappoints you. And sometimes God does that, let's be honest. He disappoints us. And yet they were still going to serve Jesus even after he hadn't done what they expected. Also notice that they prepared to serve him. This wasn't just a, let's go up to the tomb and see what we can do. They actually made time. They, they took effort to prepare. You know, you say our, our worship team here, so weren't they great this morning? Huh? Wasn't that worship team awesome this morning? They were here Friday night before the Good Friday service practicing. And they were out a few moments before the service this morning. They were preparing to serve the Lord. And many times if we want to serve God, yes, sometimes things will come up spontaneously. But a lot of our opportunities takes time to prepare. So we put thought into it. We put effort into it. They showed their dedication to Jesus. But they had a problem. So they get up in the morning. They're going to go to the tomb. And as they're on their way, they ask this question. Who's going to roll away the tomb? The stone. There was a big stone placed in front of of Jesus' tomb, a huge one, it says, a huge stone. And they're going there, they want to get in to anoint the body, but there's these three ladies, and you know, the, st the stone was very large. Who will roll it away? You see, friends, often when we set out to do something for Jesus, there will be problems. Sometimes God will put something in our heart to do for him, and we really don't know how we're going to get it done. You know, I want to do this for the Lord, but I can't roll away that stone. I can't do this. I can't do that. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be problems. There's going to be difficulties on the way. So what a lot of people do, because they don't know how to solve these problems, they sit back and don't do anything. But notice what it says here. They were already on their way. Even though they didn't know how, how the stone was going to be moved, they set out for the tomb anyway. Don't let what, they didn't let what they couldn't do stop them from doing what they could do. We can prepare the spices. We can go to the tomb. We know where it is. We can get there early. We can anoint the body, but how this go? I don't know, but we're not going to sit home and do nothing because we don't know how we can roll away the stone. We're going to set out. We're going to start out to do what we want to do for Jesus, even though that there are obstacles in the way. There are times in our lives God asks us to do things we don't think we are able to do. We have challenges to overcome. But they started out anyway. 
They didn't let what they couldn't do stop them from what they could do. You know, it kind of reminds me of the children of Israel when they were coming out of Egypt. So as they came, they're all excited. We've been delivered from slavery. God's going to take us to the promised land. And they come out of Egypt and they come right to the edge of the Red Sea. How are we going to get across? No idea. While they're contemplating this obstacle, they look behind and they see big clouds of smoke that Pharaoh and his army is coming after them. So they're crying out, oh God, Moses, why did you lead us out here? Now we're all going to be killed in the desert. Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt for us? So they're sitting there with this obstacle in front of them, with a threat behind them, and they're crying out, and Moses goes to the Lord, says, Lord, what are we going to do? And it's very interesting what God said to Moses. This, this verse a few years ago spoke to me so strongly. God said, tell the people to get moving. Now, this was before he parted the Red Sea. So you know how we want it done? We want God to part the Red Sea first. Oh, so we know how we're getting out of this jam. Now, let's go. God says, tell the people to get moving. Pack up your stuff. Pack up your tents. Pack up your, all the things that you're carrying with you. Get your kids ready and start walking towards the Red Sea, even though they didn't know how they were going to get across it. Many times in our lives, this is where we come, to a place where we want to do something for God, and yet there's an obstacle, so we just stand there, waiting for God to do something, when many times, you know what's happening? God is waiting for us to do something. You're never going to see the stone rolled away if you don't go to the tomb. So when God is asking you to do something, many times there are all kinds of questions. I, I remember when I... First, after I got over the excitement when I was first um, knew I was going to be going to Macau, I remember after, you know, I was getting ready, suddenly I got hit with a bunch of fear. I was all excited first because you know anything about me, when I get something, new opportunity, I'm all for it. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's do this. And then when it comes to the reality of it is, oh boy. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do? I don't know the language. I don't know the culture. I've never been a missionary. I've never even been trained as a missionary. I talked about this last Sunday a little bit. You know, doing something you've never done before. And I was like, oh dear, what am I going to do? And uh, so I remember I went to see um, Dr. Roger Stronstad, one of my former Bible school teachers who had kind of helped me facilitate all this stuff. And I asked Roger, I said, Roger, what do I have to share with these people? I don't know their language. I don't know their culture. I'm just, just I'm not trained as a missionary. He looked at me and he says, your knowledge of the word of God. So with that alone, I got on a plane, headed for Hong Kong, not knowing a clue what was going to happen, not having any idea how I was going to communicate or what I was going to do, but trusting that by the time I got there, someone will have rolled the stone away. And again, all these years later, look at where I am today. <laughs> if I hadn't let the fear of it, how am I going to do this? How am I going to minister to these people? I don't know anything about them, their culture. If I had let that keep me from stepping on that Cafe Pacific flight, I'm sure I wouldn't even be here today. Sometimes God wants us to step out even though we don't know how it's going to happen. They went anyway. When they got there, they got a surprise. First of all, the stone was rolled away. It had already been done. It didn't happen, you know, it didn't, they didn't sit there and get there and say, okay, here's this stone. Okay, Lord, please move. No, no. It was already rolled away when they arrived. God had already taken care of it. Reminds me of the story of Moses. Again, when, when God called Moses. Moses began to talk about the stones in the way. If you read the story when God, remember the burning bush when God called Moses? Moses starts to shoot back excuses. Lord, what if they won't believe me? Lord, um, you know, what if they ask me who called me? And every excuse God gives him, Moses gives, God gives him an answer. And finally Moses comes up with this. He says, God, 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 uh, you, 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 you know I, I'm not good, I don't sp 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 speak well. And, and how am I going to say this thing? 
And so Moses is thinking because he, you know. And here's what God said. And I noticed something in this a while ago when I was going through the book of Exodus. We know that God said, you know, what about your brother Aaron? He speaks well. But you know what God said to also? He said, he's already on his way to see you. Before Moses mentioned his objection, God had already solved it. Friends, that's the case. Many times, God still wants us to take that step of faith. He wants us to leave and go to the tomb, and he, the stone has already been rolled away before they even got there. Many times, that's the way God wants to work in our lives. There was an angel sitting there. Wow. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 1.14, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Who are the people who inherit salvation? Us. God still sends his angels to care for us. Jesus was not there. He had risen. Now imagine this surprise. I mean, it was a big enough surprise stone rolled away. But that they probably could have, you know, oh, well, praise God, somebody got here earlier than us and rolled the stone away. This is cool. The last thing they expected was to see an angel with the message, he's alive. They went to anoint a dead body, and instead they found the risen Savior. Amen. You know one of the many great things I love about God? He's good at surprising us. Anytime you ask God to do something, God does something more. Beyond what you could imagine, I, I was I, I was wondering whether I should use this illustration because oh, well, another another little minor announcement here. This Friday at seven thirty is our combined prayer meeting here at the church Chinese English combined prayer meeting seven thirty. I'm going to come out and pray together, and I'm actually going to be sharing a bit about this story in the in the prayer meeting. So I'll try not to overlap too much. But the story is Peter is kept in was arrested and he was put in prison and he was chained between by he was bound to 16 soldiers in at the inner cell of the prison and the next day he's going to be brought out put on a, 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 a sham trial and executed and it says the church was praying for him but then something strange happens in this story it says an angel again there's the angel again comes and wakes Peter up in the middle of the night. Happens to me occasionally. An angel wakes me up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Open the window, it's too warm. Close the window, it's too cold. You're on too far on my side of the day. Whatever, I get woken up by an angel in the night quite often. <laughs> Peter gets up and the chains all fall off him. The angel leads him out of the prison. You know what Peter thinks in the story? He thinks he's having a dream. Because you can do cool things in dreams, right? I like to fly in my dreams. You can see me fly in my dreams. It's pretty cool. That's why I have bad person. Oops, sorry. And she wakes me up. And um, when he gets outside the prison, it says, he comes to himself and realizes, wow, this really is happening. And then he goes to the house where the church is praying. And this part of the story I love. And I'm going to, I'll talk about it again Friday, but more focus on a different aspect. He knocks on the door and where they're all gathered. Pray, Lord, save Peter. Lord, somehow deliver Peter. And a servant girl goes to the door and looks out and she goes, it's Peter. She goes back and goes, everybody, Peter is at the door. You know what they say to her? Don't be so foolish. You're crazy. Peter's in prison. No, he's really there. Honestly, he's at the door. He's not. And it's funny because Peter is on the lamb here, right? Peter has been an escapee from prison, and he's out there banging on the door. Let me in. Right? They're, they're all debating in here. Finally, they say, well, it must be his ghost. Maybe he's already been killed, and this is his ghost. There's faith. They went, and they were astonished to find Peter waiting at the door. God surprised them. You know, they were probably praying for, please let Herod drop the charges, or, you know, or maybe he'll be merciful, maybe just, you know, and, and all that. They didn't expect him to show up at the door. But God is so great at surprising us. God, when we set out to do something for God in spite of the obstacles, God will surprise us. Then the final point, 
Again, you guys got to learn this. And the final point. It's another 15 minutes. Don't get too excited. They had a responsibility once they had gotten there. What was their responsibility? He said, the angel said, now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Now that they had discovered that Jesus was alive, their responsibility was to go and tell. They couldn't keep this great news to themselves. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, go into all the world. Go and tell others. That's really the Great Commission. Just expand it a little bit. What does our God call us to do once we know Jesus is alive? Go tell others. Don't keep it to yourself. Why would we keep this marvelous message? Go and tell others. Go tell his disciples. What do you tell them? First of all, tell them that Jesus is alive. Theme of apostolic preaching. Our God is alive. Not just, again, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, it's not just he rose, that's wonderful, but he's alive today. I mentioned again, going to the Philippines in a couple of weeks, my first trip ever to the Philippines was in, um, in 1992. I was in Macau, and we put together a mission team to go to the Philippines for uh, almost three weeks to do uh, uh, meetings and, and that. And I remember it was Good Friday, Good Friday, 1992. We were driving down to a church to, to do an a outdoor meeting that night. And, as a, and I was still, I've been preaching every day. We had seen great results. A lot of people coming to the Lord, some dramatic healings, uh, demons cast out, just, just great meetings. But I was getting pretty tired by now. And so I'm tired, so I'm, I'm driving in a jeepney. If you ever go to the Philippines, make sure you take a ride in a jeepney. It's a, sort of a bus crossed with a jeep. It's, it's hilarious. They're, they're sort of fun. And I, I'm driving in this jeepney all the way, and I'm sitting there thumbing through my Bible, trying to look for a sermon. I think, well, it's Good Friday, maybe something about the cross. Or I'm trying to come up with this. And suddenly we passed an Easter procession, or a Good Friday procession. A whole bunch of people, they were walking. This is terrible. They were walking down the road, and they had a picture, you know, a crucifix up there with Jesus on the cross. And they were taking whips, and they were whipping themselves, mm -hmm. whipping it around the sides. And their backs looked almost raw, bleeding, and all that. And I thinking, oh, goodness, what are they doing? And suddenly I thought, their God isn't alive. They're mm -hmm. focusing on the death of Jesus, which is important. But that's what they're making all this worship and sacrifice and all that for. So I suddenly I got a theme for the message. The message was, is your God alive? So anyway, I get to the church. And I meet there. And the pal we had a drama team and a music group with us. Great team we were traveling with. And I was telling the pastor all the wonderful things that had happened during our crusades the last couple of weeks. And he, he looks at me and says, well, don't expect that here. He said, I've been pastoring here for 20 years. I've barely got 20 people in my church. So we might get a few extra people come out because it's a special thing. But he says, as soon as your drama team and your music group is finished, they'll probably leave. They won't stick around. Say, you got great faith. <laughs> you wonder you only got 20 people in 20 years. That kind of faith. I didn't say that to him, but <laughs> I thought it, honest. So actually, huge crowd show of 100 people. Wow. So we had our music team went on, did some music, we had our drama team went on, and they did some drama, everybody was enjoying it. And before, and, and when the drama finished, I just took the microphone and I went to the front and I said, I have one question for you tonight, is your God alive? And I preached the message and no one left. And that night, 58 people came forward to accept Jesus as their Savior. Surprise! Because he's alive! Friends, that's the message. The message we have to this world is not just live by these principles and you'll live a better life. Or, you know, there was this man who lived 2,000 years ago who taught us some, a good way to live. No, it's not about coming and becoming part of a church and, and believing certain things, although that's important. But rather, our message to the world around us today is Jesus is alive. And not only does that mean that he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, but he lives in our life. He answers our prayers. He does things. He changes our lives. He provides for us. He does miracles still today. 
That's the message we need to have. This is not about just another religion. You know what's amazing? All the world's major religions, Mohammed, he's dead. He's buried in, in Mecca, I think. Isn't it? And you can go, Muslims go and visit his grave. Buddha lived in Sri Lanka, Buddhist country. They have statues of him everywhere. Nobody says he's alive. He died. Like, I think they know where he's supposed to be buried. They know that. Hindus, well, they have 300,000 gods or something like that. They have a god for everything. And in, in, nobody said any of those gods, those gurus that t teach Hinduism, they're, they're all, all dead. Confucius taught some wonderful things. Here's my favorite Confucius proverb. Okay, you have to think about this for a moment. Confucius say, he who cooks carrots and peas in the same pot is unsanitary. And peas in the same pot? <laughs> a few people starting to get it now slowly, okay? He who cooks carrots, comma, and peas in the same pot is unsanitary. Peas as in urinate, peas. <laughs> Took a minute to get that. But guess what? As I'm sure most of you know, Confucius died. And he's still dead. <laughs> Jesus. We were in Israel a year and a half ago. We went to see what they say is the tomb of Jesus. I'm not sure if it's a real one or not. But one thing for sure, it's empty. Jesus alive. That's what makes him different. That's what makes the Christian faith different from all other faiths. That, though, that our Jesus, our Lord, yes, he died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sins. But he rose again and he's alive today. And then you know what they told? They also were to tell where you can find Jesus. He's got ahead of you in Galilee. You can meet him there. We tell the world he's alive. We also tell them they can find him. It's not just the message that Jesus, you know, the founder of Christianity, he rose from the dead, but rather you can find him today. He wants to meet you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to know you. What a wonderful message to share with a lost world that's looking for hope, looking for joy, looking for something to hang on to. We serve a God who's alive. That's the message. I'll give you some final thoughts about this message, some things we can learn from it. One, serve Jesus even when you're discouraged. Even when God disappointed you, don't give up on you. And they could have said, well, that's it. We followed Jesus for three years. We thought he was the Messiah. He was arrested, crucified, and buried. That's it. Let's give it up. They didn't. They kept serving him, even when it seemed like all hope was gone. Secondly, serving Jesus will often bring problems. God asks you to do something. It's not always easy. Sometimes we think, you know, if God asks me to do something, I'm just going to go do it, and everything's going to be fine. Ha, 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 ha. I sure wish it was. Many times, if you're going to do something for God, you're going to run into obstacles. If you're going to go to the promised land, you're going to run into the Red Sea. If you're going to go to the tomb, the stone's going to be there. Third thing, don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can. If we wanted to see, you know what we want? We want to see the end before we leave, Right? Sometimes in God, you've got to start out on the journey, and he'll show you one step at a time. And there may be certain things in what you want to do for God that you don't know how I'm going to get past it. Fourthly, Jesus is going to surprise you by what he does. He's a God of surprises. He's a God of, I had so many surprises in my life, it's so amazing. God doesn't just do what he wants to do, and he does more than we expect. The Bible says he is able to do more than we could ask or even imagine. That's a pretty powerful verse, because as my wife will tell you, i got a big imagination. Oh, do I ever. I have an incredible imagination. And yet, let me tell you, actually coming to the end of, we've got one more month of the end of April, I'll be finishing 37 years of ministry. You took, I know, I don't even look 37, right? I do? Oh, okay. <laughs> said, yes. Okay. And I could have taken that either way. Um, if you had told me 
when I started 37 years ago, the things that God would have done through my life. You would have told me that I would be here today. You know when I started out? Let me take you a little, little off topic here, but who cares? Um, when I start, when I graduated from Bible school, I, I, my goal was going back to Newfoundland. In fact, the day after graduation, I was in a car headed east. That was where my calling was. There were two things that I, I was, I was hoping, you know, I thought I might be an evangelist, I might be a pastor, but there were two things I said I will never do. I actually said this. One, I said I will never be a missionary. Never had a call, never felt I had a missionary calling, and it gets worse. I said I will never pastor in BC. I honestly, when I lived here first, I didn't really like it that much. And now I look back and go, surprise! <laughs> God will surprise us and go tell others about the risen Christ. Go tell others. I'll tell you one last story from my family life about this. Um, my dad graduated from Bible school in 1962. And he, had, he, he wanted to go out and be a pastor, but in his heart somewhere he had a desire to become a Bible school teacher. That was his life. So he said that he would give... Um, he would go and get five years experience as a pastor, which would help him, you know, if he's going to go teach other students. And then he would think about it. Well, 12 years, two kids later, he still hadn't done it. And there was a reason why. Because when my dad grew up, his father worked for the railway. My grandfather, he was a section foreman, and they moved a lot. And quite often they moved in the middle of the year. So they moved in the middle of the year, they moved from one school to another, and he would, they would be teaching different stuff, and he would be behind, so he didn't do well in school. It also didn't help the fact that he was, I won't say blind, but he was almost blind and didn't know it. He couldn't read what was, he didn't know anything about, you know, he couldn't read what was being written on the board or anything. In fact, when he, so eventually, after he quit school, after he failed twice, he quit school, and they took him to an eye doctor and found out that, yes, his vision is very poor, but with glasses he could actually see. So that was one thing. So he went to work for the railway with his father. You know, that's how you get jobs, right? Your father is the foreman, so that's how he got his job, the old-fashioned way, right? And uh, he worked with the railway, but he was still feeling God's call to ministry. So he went to Bible school. Now, back then, in 1959, if you were just love the Lord and you wanted to serve him, you could get into a Bible school. Back then they took almost anybody as long as their faith was strong. So he graduated in 1962, entered ministry, and he always wanted to go on to seminary so he could become a Bible school teacher. But he had two obstacles. One, he said, I'm not smart. I, I didn't do good in school. He did okay in Bible school. But he said the bigger thing was, I did graduate from high school. What seminary is going to accept me? to go for a master's degree if I didn't even finish high school. And he even looked into do I have to go do my GED or whatever, and he was just he fretted about it for a long time. Now, you notice that it was the women who went to the tomb first? There's something to that. My mother finally got tired of this. So one day, a letter comes in the mail to our house and my, from the um, Assemblies of God Theological Seminary in Springfield, Missouri. And Dan opens says, Dear Pastor Baker, we've received your letter about your interest in pursuing your master's degree. Go, what? what are you talking about? He goes, since you've already graduated from Eastern Pentecostal Bible College, we would accept their, you based on those years, and whatever happened in high school is irrelevant. Now you've already gone to a Bible school and graduation. He goes, I didn't write that. My mom's calling, yeah, you did. She wrote a letter, signed his name to it, and sent it off. Again, the woman went to the tomb, right? Got, notice that the, the disciples weren't going to the tomb? Jesus is dead. We can't, you know, they, so it was the woman. So he found out that the obstacle that he thought was going to be there had been already rolled away. And he went and finished not one but two master's degrees, graduated with honors, and later went on to teach many, many years at our Bible school uh, here in, in Abbotsford. He had to take the first step. If it had been up to him, he probably would have gone years more. Oh, what am I going to do? I'd love to do this, but I can't because my mom says, well, we're going to try anyway. We're going to take that first step and wait for God to roll away the stone. 
And I just feel sense in my spirit. Probably when we worship him and come back. Let's sing that first song we sang at the beginning. And there's been a reason why you haven't started it. Because something's in the way. You say, I want to go to the tomb, but I don't know how. I, I can't move that stone. These three ladies, they, it wasn't a thing of, we'll get there and we'll try real hard, maybe. Well, no, 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 they knew we can't. So there's an obstacle in the way. God is saying this. We set out for the tomb anyway. And God is going to surprise you. Amen? Let's stand together. I know my